to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Hello and welcome to our book club. I'm Mary Menon and today we have uh, the spotlight on a book called Time's Monster by Stanford professor uh, Priya Satya who joins us from the US. Uh, it is a book that looks and takes a hard look at the subject of history, the science of history, the art of history and how it kind of uh, justified, aided and abetted uh, the rise of colonialism and all the excesses that went with it uh, between the 18th and 20th century. Many questions uh, arise in the mind when you talk about uh, the sweep of history and how it has influenced our present as well. And Priya joins us to talk about all of this. Priya, thank you so much for joining us. Time's Monster, what a great title. And uh, you were explaining to me how you arrived at the title about how a monster was created and unleashed in the 18th century. So I'm going to ask you to explain that to our viewers. Thank you, yes, I'd love to. Thank you, Minnie, and thank you for having me on this show. So the book is about um, a particular approach to history that's invented in the 18th century um, by Enlightenment philosophers in Europe, but it eventually spreads everywhere. Um, and it's invented with very good intentions. The idea there is that history is a discipline that we can study to um, inculcate virtue, especially in a particular class of young men with uh, political aspirations, let's say. And uh, the idea there was that uh, you don't maybe always need to look to religion for ethical training, that uh, worldly existence offers a series of examples and tests of virtue that we can study to become uh, virtuous ourselves with a sense of how history is going to judge us in the future. And the intention here again is very positive, but just like in the story of Frankenstein's monster, which is sort of what the, my title is playing on, um, this idea winds up kind of outrunning the control and the vision of those who invented it and ends up kind of enabling a lot of uh, harm in the world, and in particular, my book looks at the, the way it informed um, British imperialism in the modern period and the harm that that, uh, that caused. So uh, to sum up, uh, you know, uh, you have spoken about three dimensions. One is, of course, history, uh, talking about great people to inspire. There was another use of history to justify and say that it was for the larger good. And the third phase of history, and I'm, I'm you know, summarizing it in a very basic way. The third uh, part of history was how to bring order, how, how uh, colonialism was bringing order in the world. So I'm going to break it up. But where do you see this transition where uh, history and history writers start gradually, uh, you know, um, uh, supporting the colonial ambitions? When did that shift happen? So in the middle of the 18th century, um, a, a lot of influential people who are actually making decisions about um, empire and you know what uh, what are the what what is ethical in pursuing power abroad um, were actually what people we would look back at and call historians, right? So these were people who were um, such known as such great philosophers in their time that they had that kind of influence in actual decision making. Um, so if you, you can think of someone like in the 18th century, someone like Edmund Burke or Thomas Paine or um, Joseph Priestley. Um, in, and slightly later, you can think of someone like James Mill, right, who writes the first official history of the of British activity in, uh, in India and uh, rises up to become, uh, you know, uh, the highest post in the East India Company bureaucracy. And his history book becomes sort of a textbook for anyone wanting to be in the Indian government service. So there's a lot of um, like direct influence between people we would call historians and the people actually um, running the empire, deciding what's permissible, what's a scandal, how far the British should go. And what you see from the 18th century is that time and time again, when they're confronted with some ethical quandary, there is this habit of saying, 
of, you know, two things. One, that the assumption is that history is always going to be a narrative of progress. So sometimes when something looks like it's questionable, you have to suspend judgment because you know, even though God is not intervening directly in the world, he's exercising a kind of providential care. He's guaranteeing that in the end, there's going to be something good. And you have to have faith that sometimes we as humans are poor judges of what's right and wrong in the moment. And we need to wait and see what history is going to judge. So it sort of makes them, it creates a culture in which people are doubting their ordinary moral instincts and saying, wait, I need to set that aside. I need to have a stiff upper lip. I need to wait and see uh, what history uh, is gonna reveal. And, and, and then perhaps it will be progress and I shouldn't doubt myself. And sometimes you need to be stoic and sort of, uh, you know, the typical uh, British gentleman. And, and that, that's what this, this training, this moral training was all about. And so, uh, and so there's this idea of progress. There's this idea of setting aside ordinary ethics. And there's this idea of great men, that great men are the ones who make history. They are the ones who even can um, interpret history. And they are the ones who uh, can, can never, their, their greatness lies in the fact that they are above and beyond ordinary moral boundaries. And we need them for history to advance. So you're gonna have to expect transgression of ordinary ethics. Um, and so you see this, this pattern of thought justifying, um, you know, time and time again, all kinds of activities that end, end up making the, the history of empire. Right, there are three, four aspects I want to stream that I want to pick on, uh, Priya, in this. The first uh, harks back to your last book, which is Empire of the Gun and the Violent Making of the Industrial Revolution. Now, in most analysis, uh, in the Industrial Revolution is, is seen as a leap of human endeavor, uh, a leap of human economy. And you've kind of looked at it from a very different perspective and uh, justifiably so with the kind of data that you pulled out. So do you think that this justification in the name of progress of just about anything, even gun toting, slavers, for instance, all of that, uh, you know, kind of becomes more crystallized uh, at the time of the Industrial Revolution? Yeah, so yes, my last book was on the Industrial Revolution, and it's trying to push back against this idea that um, the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain because there was a culture of, a unique culture of, uh, valuing entrepreneurship and uh, supporting invention, which you didn't find anywhere else in the world. And what I argue instead is we have not paid attention enough to the context of continual war in which the Industrial Revolution unfolded. And in fact, and I looked particularly at the um, firearms industry, what you can see is that a lot of military contracting work was driving um, risk taking and invention and uh, experimenting with new forms of industrial organization to create the um, industrial revolution in Britain in the period. So it's, it's and, and all that military activity was of course completely connected to um, British um, imperial expansion in the very same period. Um, and, and the slave trade is also part of that story because that's another sort of state, it's, it's, a, it's an activity that traders are involved in but that the state always protects and is willing to go to war to protect. Um, seeing it very much as um, part of the advancement of British um, mercantile power uh, and interests. So, um, so definitely there's a sort of partnership there between public and private, you know, what we call sectors, which, but which I think they're, they're, they're never really sectors. I mean, the whole history of capitalism is always about that partnership. We see it today. I mean, I live in Silicon Valley and that, that's really what, what's going on. Um, but yeah, so, so this book came out of... Um, a reflection, further reflection on the main character in that story, who was actually the, a, a Quaker. So the biggest gun maker in, in, in England in the 18th century was actually a Quaker. And, and if we know anything about Quakers, it's that um, they don't believe in war, right? War is unchristian. And so there's a kind of interesting mystery there. Why was this Quaker man making guns and how did he live with that in his conscience? And so when I thought about it more and I, I reflected on the way he defended it, that sort of led to this new book where, you know, I thought he went, one argument that he makes is that um, he's helpless in the situation in which providence has placed him. So he makes an argument about history, 
that I'm in a particular historical moment where there's war all around me and this is what's driving the economy. And I really can't fulfill my commitments as a Quaker because I'm a tool of history, right? Mm -hmm. And he was not just a gun maker, he was a member of this enlightenment culture and he was friends with some of the people I already mentioned like Joseph Priestley, who are making very similar arguments about history and the way it constrains our agency and how we all end up fulfilling its providential plan. And it occurred to me then that those, those ideas being available was so helpful in, for um, someone like him to be able to justify his participation in war making and in, in imperialism and slaving and all kinds of things that would actually, he knew were violating his, his actual deeply held ethical commitments as a Quaker and a Christian. Right. You know, nowhere is this dichotomy, and, and uh, you refer to it uh, as evident as when you talk about slavery and how uh, Western countries actually saw it. So you have the French Revolution uh, and uh, what comes out of it, the government or the, or, or, or the people, including Napoleon, they're very ambivalent and confused about how to deal with the issue of slavery. I mean, when you talk about the rights of citizen in, in France and Paris, do citizens or humans elsewhere have the same rights? Now, England or Britain has a very different take on this uh, because they take the moral high ground because they are among the first to ban slavery. And yet we have many, many more as dangerous forms of slavery that persist right through the empire, right to the uh, 20th century when thinkers over there were waxing eloquent about uh, human rights, about liberalism, about, uh, you know, of, of progress. And yet you have this underpinning of, uh, of this thing, which is kind of put under the carpets. Definitely. I mean, even today, people who defend uh, the history of empire, of the British Empire within Britain today, they, they believe in this myth that uh, the empire actually existed only to stop slavery. Um, and it's absolutely a myth. I mean, the empire first was built on slavery. And yes, the British helped to ban the slave trade and then to ban slavery itself in the 1830s within the empire. But as you said, they continue to rely on all kinds of bonded labor. I mean, labor that's not very different from slave labor in which many, many Indians uh, in particular were um, uh, exploited. Um, to, to do the work that slaves used to do. So Indians are shipped as indentured servants um, out to the Caribbean and the same sugar plantations where slaves worked. And uh, even within Britain, by the end of the 19th century, you have, you know, sort of radical critics who are pointing out that, you know, we go around touting how much we're doing to end slavery when actually our entire empire depends on thinly veiled slavery. I mean, that, you know, there, there are people who are actually calling it out in the time, and yet this myth persists. And, you know, on the one hand, we need to appreciate the abolition movement and the effects that it had and the courage that that took. But on the other hand, we, we have to also accept the limits of it and uh, the kind of rationalizations that continued after that. And, and, and I think one of the mysteries that, you know, historians Try to understand and what I've tried to do in this book is to, to just understand those rationalizations. How can people who believe so much in abolition then go on uh, relying on slave type of labor? And, and so then again, you know, some of these ideas about history, some ideas about race, all help justify that um, and its continuance. As you said, you know, up to our present, there's, there's still a lot of bonded labor in the world. Right. I have a couple of questions on how uh, the echoes of that era are even visible today, but I am going to ask you another uh, interesting uh, idea that was kind of propagated uh, by Britain was how, uh, you know, there was the phase of the East India Company, which was horrible, where they were villains, they were greedy, and then the crown comes in and it becomes uh, more sedate, more kind of organized, more kind of... Uh, uh, you know, um, I think well-intentioned, uh, you know, management of colonial affairs. So there was a, an attempt to purge the past and try and uh, rewrite uh, how uh, the colonies saw uh, the crown, so to say. And the Commonwealth is a great example 
of that idea persisting in some ways you know so how do you see that that phase well so yes there there's a lot of um soul searching um after the first few decades of rule in india and uh it's still a period of company rule until 1858 and even then though in the first half of the 19th century there is a sense that well we we had a really um uninspired and cruel um a rule that that really wasn't about anything moral or anything good um in the 18th century and we need to atone for that and the way we're going to atone for that is we're not going to give up empire we're going to remain here in india but we're going to have different aims right like you were saying the intentions change so we're going to reform indian society and it's a big favor to india and it's a civilizing mission right so that's a completely racist premise but nevertheless yes the attitude here is different from the 18th century but and then you know there's this massive massive rebellion uh by the indians in 1857 which is a a huge war actually and the british have to work very hard and very uh brutally to crush this rebellion and then again the attitude shifts and that's when crown rule begins and yes there is a sort of they take a step back in the sense that they give up on those hopes of totally reforming indian society and making them completely british and there's a sense that we should not tamper with uh religious practice and things like that um and you know the company is abolished and and all that at the and but there is now an even more racist um kind of approach to empire in that okay uh we will have to be babysitting these indians forever because they're never going to be reformed because they're they obviously are um racially incapable of it and this is the same period when modern race science starts to emerge in the second half of the 19th century and that also is used to justify uh this new uh kind of more pessimistic approach to ruling india so it's not that it becomes softer or better or in any way i mean i think the search for sort of better kinds of imperial governance is a little futile and sometimes misses the point because once it's it's rule without consent once it's based on racism and and routine violence it is an illegitimate form of rule whether the company is ruling or the crown is ruling and so it it's still it's different kinds of imperialism and it's important to note those differences but it's still imperialism you know what amazes me uh, as uh, as somebody who loves history and also has spent two decades as a journalist is how a lot of these ideas and notions have have very obviously seeped into contemporary affairs as well the entire division between the oriental and the occidental which is really um about order and uh, you know a, a certain other way of doing things the way the west and the imperial powers saw um asia specifically and uh, and europe or uh, anything west of 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 that also has determined the way we they have perceived current affairs and and world politics now you know you make a point about the iraq war and i remember uh, you know when we were covering it i mean it was appalling how the world ganged up to to create this whole world of uh, uh, uh weapons of mass destruction which were never there and really justified the entire uh, battle now in do you think that a lot of the contemporary world has been shaped by this period where uh, a lot of ideas like this division between them and us kind of seeped into the to the very psyche of of how they were engaging with the world Yes definitely i mean the what what you're describing is um what we call orientalism this idea that the occident is um where there's history uh where uh, there's historical agency where there's change and progress and the orient which is passive um and erotic and exotic and um uh, incapable of changing on its own and it needs the occidental person or group you know to to in, intervene and and bring history to it in a sense so that was the kind of um kind of a foundational premise of you know understanding go you know how history works for for Europeans from the you know at least the 18th century if not earlier and you're right it 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 doesn't go away it remains with us the cold war i think helped ingrain it even deeper uh dividing the world along very similar lines and absolutely in the in the 
run up or uh, ramp up to the Iraq War of 2003, you see the, you see the invocation of all those um, typical myths and tropes about the Arab mind or, or Arab uh, society and uh, Muslim societies being having particular qualities, needing uh, Western intervention uh, to to uh, solve all their problems. Um, absolutely, you see the and, and the people doing it. I mean, it's it's the British and and the United States in partnership, and there's definitely a sort of passing of the baton uh, between them. You know uh, what what is scary, Priya, is that the deep uh, deep uh, impact that has had and the persistence of it. I mean, look at what has happened in the U.S. over the last year, year and a half. The Black Lives Matter campaign, the the questions that it raised, and the most recent events at Capitol, Capitol which showed that th there is that conservative, uh, really um, outlandish, outdated core, which kind of persists over there. So obviously, uh, you know, these are, uh, this Times monster has done its work well, because, you know, you really can't, uh, uh, do you see change? Because there is a lot of writing uh, critiquing this, but, you still have uh, an equal amount of backlash of what people call a collective amnesia of what really happened in that period. So, you know, all your voices, are they getting drowned out by this wall of collective amnesia? It's so interesting. It's hard to tell when you're in the middle of it what the story is going to be like, right? So you have no choice but to sort of just do what you understand to be your part in it. Like, I mean, you can think of it as, you know, you can you, you can draw on any you know ethical uh, guide that you can think of in that in that in that way. But um, definitely, I think one one of the reasons why we we see um, the kinds of you know white supremacist movements that we have right now in the U.S. Uh, is because we have not for so long dealt properly with the legacies of the period of colonialism, the period of slavery. Um, and that's what movements like Black Lives Matter or Roads Must Fall, they're sort of demanding an end to that practice, that very deliberate practice of amnesia and saying, look, these legacies of empire, the inequalities, the climate disaster, the, the ongoing racism, none of this stuff is getting addressed. It's been swept from the table. Let's put it back on the table. Let's understand how we got here. And let's figure out how we can deal with the past in such a way that we can make a different kind of present and future. And what you see, I think, in, in with this, you know, the, the momentum of this white supremacist uh, thought and activity here is, and I don't know if it's a backlash against that, or if it's just part of a fight against that, or if it's responding to a related set of problems, right? Insofar as, you know, climate change is affecting a lot of the communities in the Southern United States, right? You, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and sort of intensifying existing inequalities. I mean, all these things, all the problems sort of just play on each other and exacerbate one another. And so it, it really is time, I think, to come to terms with the past in a way that um, I think because of the Cold War and then the war on terror, it, was, it just kept getting uh, deferred or the old way of thinking just kept getting uh, new lease on life again and again. And, and it's enough now. You know, you know uh, while this is one aspect of it, there is another uh, aspect uh, that I would like to ask you about. One is, it, you know, a, a cold hard look at history uh, as a subject, like you have done, also underlines that we use metrics or values uh, that a society uh, upholds as a, as a prism to see the past at any given point. So if it is about enlightenment, about the romantic uh, period, you know, you have the, the lens that you're using to look at the past are the values that you, uh, as a society, kind of uh, want to uh, propagate. You know, I mean, so there are these biases that come in. You know, I was talking to Neil uh, McGregor, for, 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 who is to head the British Museum, and he uh, was, you know, making a point of how a lot of the values that we kind of held up, the value of secularism, of world order, global peace, all of these are constructs, again, of the 20th century, when the world went through that terrible Second World War, and Nazi Germany, uh, you know, uh, conducted the state-sponsored 
uh, atrocities which were unthinkable and unimaginable even today. For the last 10 years in history, and that's what uh, the, the job of a historian is also to look at the current uh, history making process. The last 10 years, uh, you see a swing towards the right, you see a lot of the values that we kind of thought were the new normal for the world kind of change and take a different shape. As a historian, what do you make of this? Because there are undercurrents in every country. I mean, be it the US, be it India, be it uh, uh, England, and Brexit has kind of again uh, iterated this. What do you make? So, so to me, and I try to explain this in the book, I think the mistake that happened was that after all the those the horrors of World War II, which, uh, as you, you know, in Europe and and even in, you know, we had partition in South Asia, which was also horrific, right? I mean, and, and in other parts of the world at the same time, none of that was, was dealt with the right way. What happened was that there were so many creative ideas around, especially ideas that were um, coming out of anti-colonial movements. And people are trying to think of new ways of organizing the world. Let's Let's not do the nation state world order because we've seen how violent and destructive that can be. Let's, let's think some other way. And their creative ideas of federal structures or um, uh, you know, um, societies arranged according to religious values or just anything different from the enlightenment idea of the nation state. And, and all of that gets swept aside. And instead you see sort of a consecration of the same old liberal values um, that had been the excuse for empire all the time, that we're shepherding all these uh, benighted parts of the world so that they become secular, so that they embrace the idea of development, so that uh, they embrace industrialism. And those are the values that then again, because of the Cold War situation, I think, become sort of idealized again. And all those alternative ways of thinking uh, get shoved off the table. And I think, you know, like if you think about, it sounds utopic, but you know, or utopian, but you know, Gandhi's idea of uh, village republics, for instance, or a lot of Muslim thinkers were thinking of the model of the constitution of Medina, or there's somebody like Aimé Césaire, uh, who says, why break from, uh, why should Martinique break from France? Let's become a, a department of, uh, a part of France, right? And change what we mean by France, right? There are people thinking of pan-Africanism, pan-Arabism, pan-Islamism, plus the Soviet model. So there's so many creative ideas. None of that sticks. And instead, we get even more commitment to uh, liberal ideology, which was the very ideology that underwrote empire until that point. And so by deferring and deferring, and you know, and that ideology continued to create the same problems, the same inequalities, and new countries that are being decolonized are being asked to participate in this world system from a very unfair starting position, right? They've been looted, they've been destroyed, none of that is restored. And then they're saying start and compete and catch up, right? And you can't. So that's why I think we're at a point now where people are saying, okay, reparations, restitution, let's apologize, let's correct all that so that we can, you know, have a much more fair setup and, and deal with the past more constructive. But yeah, but this, uh, as I understand it, is also a critique of liberalism by you. And I can't, you know, grapple and get my mind around that because while historians might have failed and liberalism might have been used as a tool, I mean, I really don't see uh, an alternative as as strongly uh, uh, committed to uh, to a global order of peace of respect for each other than liberalism. And you know, the counter that we are seeing is is a horrible alternative. So, so how, how, I mean, convince me. <laughs> there is another way out. This is the problem with liberalism. Liberalism says you need to sacrifice in the present and you will be rewarded in the future. Progress is always around the corner and coming. Freedom is always around the corner and coming. Development is around the corner and coming. No, if you just go back to whether it's William Blake, whether it's Herbert Butterfield, whether it's Tolstoy or Gandhi, they all say no. History is not a story of progress. You can see it's not a story of progress. We're in the middle of a climate crisis, right? There's not progress, it's not gonna happen. 
history is not about that. It's you can be civilized right now. It's about being a good person right now. You can be free right now. All you have to do is not cooperate with the people who are uh, trying to take your freedom, right? So that is, it sounds utopian. It actually is a, a, a real alternative because you can't keep, you know, hitting your head against this wall of liberalism saying it's coming, it's going to come, it's going to get better. It's not going to get better that way. We're missing the point, right? The point of history is not to change the world and make the world better. The point of history is to make yourself better. But right? what the values of liberalism are Even Pope Francis says this. Muhammad Iqbal said this. Again, Tolstoy as a Christian said this. Gandhi said this. As a Hindu, so it's it's in it's across different religions, and all of them are coming from a position of religious ethics, not because they're against secularism, but because they're against liberalism, and the way it says sacrifice the present for the future. Gandhi says never sacrifice the present. You only have this moment, and you have to be accountable right now. So nonviolence is the only option. So how, what do you make of, of what is happening in the world as a historian, this shift to the right? Do you think this is a, uh, this is a um, kind of a, obviously the pendulum has swung the other way from what the uh, established regime was. And everywhere we are seeing this, uh, this frustrated uh, yeah. you know, rise of the right uh, and a more rabid right, a more uh, you know, a strident right. So you're asking why do I think that's happening? Yes. Yeah, I think because liberalism doesn't work. <laughs> it could be the alternative. I mean, this is a terrible alternative. Oh, yeah. No, we absolutely need to continuously struggle against authoritarianism, white supremacism. I mean, these are real um, threats in our time. But the answer is not to say... Um, uh, I mean, like you should protest, you should march, you should sign petitions, you should keep engaged in every kind of struggle that you can, knowing that it's while you're participating in this struggle alongside and with other people, you're, that is the success itself. It doesn't have to lead anywhere, right? So I think it's that expectation of it. That's when people get demoralized. Oh, it's not going to work. So why should I do it? What's the point of marching? It's they're never going to change. Even the Supreme Court is not on our side. That's when you talk yourself out of doing your what you have to do because you are accountable to yourself right now in okay. the present. So you cannot look for the fruit of the action is getting back to the Gita, really. I mean, sneaking that way, <laughs> because ultimately the point is, it's, it's you have to act without regard for the consequence. And it's, we think that's a Hindu idea. It's actually not. It's much more universal than that. Right. I've got two, uh, two last questions, really. One is, that in this book, you also make a case uh, for the fall of history as a discipline. And I really uh, uh, agree with that, because history is no longer part of the mainstream discussion, you know, uh, mm. even policymakers turn towards economists because they believe that they have empirical data and, you, you know, that's far more unbiased. And we know that data can be construed any possible way. So it's really not uh, the truth. But history as a discipline has been pushed into academia and dusty corners, uh, Priya. Uh, there is a lack of credibility, maybe because Everyone feels that history is so biased because of the very reasons that you speak about, that it's always about a perspective. Whose perspective are we talking about? And second, there is this uh, apathy towards uh, the importance of history as a chronicler, as, as something that shows the way. And, you know, if, if a person studies history, a lot of the answers come from there. And yet you lament about the lack of it, even sitting out of Stanford, in the US. So tell me what is happening. Is, is it really off and what can, can, can be done to redeem history? Yeah, different things. I mean, I think and on the one hand, uh, you're right in terms of expertise. It's the expertise of economists or uh, political scientists is, is held up higher in, in many societies. But at the same time, so much of you know this, this rise of the authoritarianism and the rise of um, extreme far-right ideas is all about 
history, right? It's all about bad history. You know, um, Muslims were invaders, Muslims are foreigners. That's just a bad, that's just wrong history, right? I'm talking about in India, right? Or uh, the idea that the United States has always been a white country and a Christian country. That's bad history. That's, that's not an accurate narrative. So they're actually fighting about history. I mean, the politics are all about making his different kinds of historical claims. They're just using really bad history to make them. And so, um, you know, one thing is there is that we need to cultivate much more a culture of understanding history for its own sake, so that you have greater self-knowledge and knowledge of your society, um, not because you want to become a great man and <laughs> take over the world, which was the 18th century uh, reasoning for, for studying history. I mean, the humanistic reasons for studying history are very important. So, um, and I do think what, what's common in Silicon Valley, and I think it's common uh, in, in Indian upper classes too, is this strong preference always for technical fields. Um, there is a sense that uh, that's what's practical, that's what has value. And I think that also comes out of the same liberalism mindset, which is progress needs to come. Progress depends on, it's all about technology. There's a technical solution to every problem that you face. Um, and, and so then there's a sort of deprioritizing always of humanistic endeavors. And I think that's a cultural problem. Um, and I think some of this conversation that we're having shows like yours, books like mine, movements like Black Lives Matter or Roads Must Fall, they're all forcing us to, you know, fix that. They're, people are not happy without humanistic endeavors. And you see the return of protest, you see the way poetry informs those protests, you see the, the way they uh, try to uh, call on, use symbols from the past or language from the past or figures from the past. So people, it's necessary to the human soul. And when you go without it long enough, the, you know, it, the craving comes and, and you can either fill it with bad history or better history. So we need to invest much more in all the departments that teach these, the kinds of skills that you need to understand history properly. Um, and we need to, parents need to encourage young people to pursue those things. And there are many kinds of careers you can have, uh, and you'll definitely just be a better and happier human being, which is the purpose of life. <laughs> if you- and if it's you more important because also of the false history being propagated in the new internet world. I mean, where everybody can, Wax eloquent about something without knowing uh, the ramifications and history oh, exactly. no, exactly. in yeah. the wrong hands is dangerous. You know, it's, it's just pure dangerous. So, how is the fraternity? I mean, because I know we had uh, Manan uh, Ahmed Asif uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, uh, he's done some work also critiquing colonial uh, uh, perceptions, yeah. imperial perceptions of India. We know that you're doing this body of work. Uh, what is the fraternity doing and what are the biases you yourself are fighting against? Because I know that there are many. You're a woman of color doing history uh, of, of uh, one part of the world that has not been heard. So in many senses, uh, how do you see uh, the, the field of history and departments like yours, people like yours, redeeming uh, the position of, 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 uh, of the subject? Well, I am definitely... like I. You know, if I just look at my own small career, like I came to Stanford in 2003 and it's been almost 20 years. And even in that short span in my little department, there's so much change in just the, the makeup of the department. There are many, many more women. There are many more people of color. There are many more people from other countries in the department. It's more international. So I see that change and it's hard to see, it's hard to tell right now what the impact of that will be you know, down the line, uh, but I, I, it's, it's, there is going to be an impact from them. It really does matter who's teaching and, and that changes what's being taught as well, right? The way I teach British history is, you know, 180 degrees, degrees different from the way uh, 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 any, uh, you know, any white man <laughs> would frankly teach it. And, and that's a good thing. It's not that I'm going to, you know, teach it badly or, or, you know, make the British out to be evil or anything like that. It's all about human understanding, right? But the things I focus on are going to be different, right? The, the, the people I give voice to might be different. And that's then going to change, you know, how this um, canon of knowledge is then passed on and, 
and, and who signs up for the history classes in the first place because they'll see me teaching. So I do think those kinds of things have an effect. Definitely there's more and more, there's always, I think, been a culture of historians participating in public debate. And, but I think I see that in front of my own eyes on a day-to-day -day basis, like ramping up a lot more as each, just because so much of the controversies right now are about history. And so I, I definitely see historians' voices all over the place in the media. They're, they're definitely um, pulling all their weight. You know, I don't, I don't right. think there's a- and I, and I hope that uh, that pulling of weight counts because that's exactly what we also trying to do over here in India of uh, putting uh, the focus back on true history, right history, unbiased, deeply insightful history because that's what the world needs. Uh, really um, uh, in the face of what we are facing. Thank you so much, uh, Priya. Lovely to have you uh, with us and uh, all the best and hope to see a lot more of you on Live History India. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.